any part in India, it gets no seats. In fact, more generally, you could argue that this election sees the rout of what we call the Mandal and the Paramandal parties, the parties based, parties based on caste community, arithmetic. So the Samajwadi Party, the RJD, the RLP, and to an extent the JDU are, are in fact routed. And the result uh, doesn't just see a, a change in the fortunes of this, of this party, it has a profound impact upon our understanding of the trends over the last 25 years. Because there's a sense in which the received wisdom about the provincialization of Indian politics, the mandalization of Indian politics, is challenged and one would argue set aside. The other uh, major result, and in a normal election this would be uh, perhaps the most important result, is the decline of the left in relevance. Uh, I don't, I really didn't think that I'd ever see the day when uh, the BJP got as many seats as the left did in Bingo, but you know, this has happened. Its total score, left's total score, including Tripura uh, and Kerala, is approximately 10 seats. And the other astonishing uh, increase in the political remit of the BJP is Tamil Nadu. I mean, another state which uh, is generally seen as a kind of black hole for the BJP, where its vote share is higher than the Congress. And in fact, it, it actually wins more seats than the principal rubber party of that state, the DMK. Even more significant, and I think it's truly staggering, I think in some ways it bears comparison with 1984. Even more significant is the BJP sweep of every northern and western Indian state in regional terms, it is, I think, as spectacular a result as the All India Congress drive in the Lok Sabha election. And when you consider that these wins aren't prompted by the assassination of a Prime Minister and the violence that follows, it is, in some ways, an even more impressive result. It's just completely staggering. Just look at those numbers, especially from the point of view of someone uh, like me who's hostile to BJP, and you just, you know, you just, just, just shake your head. It's just an extraordinary result. The Congress. I mean, I think you could fairly say that this is this election sees the zombification of the Congress. I mean, the Congress literally is the walking dead. <laughs> this election has reduced the Congress into a kind of zombie ground. In its heyday, uh, the Congress used to the Congress's ideological pluralism, which is a kind of debauched and degenerate way, it still retained from the from the colonial Congress. Its ideological pluralism was reflected by the electoral coalitions in which it combined varied communities and found political success. So in the Gadget campaign, for example, there was uh, the fabled uh, alliance between uh, Brahmins, Muslims, and Dalits. In Gujarat, then, I believe, a Congress state, it was Kratyas, Hanijans, Adivasis, and Muslims, handily described as Khan. After a political earthquake over the Mandir and Mandal, these coalitions unravel. The BJP made up, made up the upper castes, the SP with the, with the OBCs, the BSP with the Dalits, and after the raising of the Babi Masjid on Narsimha Rao's watch, the Muslims sought other protectors. So, wiped out in the Gajak plane, and this, we are talking about this election, we are talking about the position of Congress in the last few elections. Wiped out in the Gajak plane, the heartland of India's parliamentary politics, the Congress's claim to pan Indian power came to depend on its control of one or two or preferably two big states such as Maharashtra or Andhra Pradesh and its role as a contender in several smaller ones like Madhya Pradesh, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Assam, Rajasthan, Karnataka and Kerala. And it's interesting, it's important to recognize that the votes it received in these states had much to do with its diminished but still credible claim to being a pan-Indian party, still in some diminished way India's natural party of government. These elections have completely, and I think irrevocably, destroyed that trend. In every state in North and West India in which the Congress confronted the BJP in a two count contest, it's been literally wiped out. The BJP has overtaken the Congress even in Orissa, West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Simantra, and Tamil Nadu. Not only is the Congress's division of Andhra Pradesh, I mean, this is the most staggering uh, piece of political ineptitude, I think it, it deserves to be called a kind of case study, a kind of case study in the political dumbness. <laughs> It's a textbook example, and, but it's an important, you know, apart from stupidity, I think it's important because it tells us something about why the Congress is a lost cause. It's a textbook example in the sense of the contemporary Congress's inability to 
understand or accommodate powerful provincial leaders and such groups. The YSR Congress is what? Basically, the Congress of Sivantra under a new name. And it follows the Trinamur Congress and the Nationalist uh, uh, Congress Party, the NCP, which walked out of the Congress 15 years ago in 1998 and 1999. The important thing to remember is that all of these parties walk out for exactly the same reason the chronic political deafness of a dynasty hyper. You know, Dilly Dragan's death, the Nehru Gandhi dynasty, would please claim that the dynasty served the political purpose. Indra Gandhi became by virtue of long tenancy and her victory in the war in 1971. Charismatic dynasty. She won general elections for her party. Even, or especially in death, she posthumously won the Congress an enormous majority in Parliament in 1984. Since then, the Congress has been, and this is ironical, in secular decline, and the dynasty's reason for being has gradually disappeared. When a political party can't offer powerful politicians the prospect of, of the top job, because it's permanently reserved for the first family. And when the first family can't deliver seats at election time, either because the incumbent dynasty has had a charisma bypass, or because he doesn't know how to do democratic politics, dynastic politics has run its miserable course. I think this is what we see in the case of, uh, of the Congress now. It's interesting that the BJP, because it doesn't have a dynastic center, is able to cope with, in a sense, the provincialization of Indian politics much better. It actually has powerful provincial leaders which, who see themselves as partners within a pan-Indian project. And Modi is obviously uh, the foremost of them, but it's not as if he's the only one. You know, all of them, in a sense, are uh, yeah. capable political men who are not, if you will, servants of a high command. They are they're equal partners and increasingly more equal than the so-called pan-Indian politicians that make up the BJP's Delhi-based government. For the last 15 years, ambitious Congress with regional bases have been abandoning the party for precisely this reason. Because in an era of coalition, a regional heavyweight has more political leverage outside the Congress party than he does, if he has an independent party, than he does as a provincial franchisee of the dynasty's private. I mean, why would you actually rationally stay within the Congress if you had, which is why uh, the principal party of Telangana has not chosen to ally with the Congress, which is why they've lost by a Of course, the Congress has learned nothing from this near death experience. Yesterday, Sharad, where the Gandhis offered their resignations and were urged to stay on, merely prolongs, in a sense, the party's death spiral. You know, uh, I sometimes think that uh, much though uh, I would wish a few seats for the BJP, Smithy Rani could have done us all the favor of defeating the government. Because if the family, I mean, I, I generally feel that if she had defeated Rahul Gandhi, the family may well have withdrawn from politics. So the absence of a political heir, I can't really see uh, Sonia Gandhi uh, having a stake within the politics of the Congress. Actually, my suspicion is that uh, so finely tuned has been the BJP's uh, uh, campaign in UP that I'm willing to believe that Amit Shah deliberately demoralized the Congress while making sure that the dynasty survived by a whisker. I'm not sure the party's distinction. <laughs> what is, given this, um, what lies, you know, what is the prospect of redemption for people who are hostile to the BJP, who see the BJP as, broadly speaking, uh, one party in I mean, I think some, some truths. No third front is likely to replace the Congress any time soon. And the principal opposition to the BJP, far less a contender for power. It's likely consequence the BSP, the AI, the MK, the Congress, the Samajwadi Party are intrinsically provincial parties, incapable of leading an all India coalition. It's worth remembering, I think it's important, it's worth remembering when we talk about third fronts. The third front governments in the past were possible because there were two roughly equal pan Indian parties that could be played off against each other. You had, right through uh, the 90s, the BJP in the Congress as substantial pan-Indian parties, roughly equivalent, but we just don't have that circumstance now. You have a behemoth, which is the BJP, and a, and a kind of run or a rump, which is, in a sense, the Congress. In a political scenario where the NDA has an absolute parliamentary majority, and the Congress has been reduced to a dysfunctional rump, one third, uh, I mean, about 
one sixth, uh, one eighth the size of Australia, a viable third front is a non starter in the near term. So, for those who see Narendra Modi and his party as, uh, uh, as a threat to, uh, to political projects that they hold here, to the notion of a pluralist nation state, as for example, I do, political redemption is likely to be a long time coming. Uh, theoretically, speculatively, it will come when a party of panic and ambition with a leader fluent in Hindi, I think this is important. We hear Rahul Gandhi speak Hindi, he used to be reminded of Mrs. Gandhi's brutish idiotic. You know, we forget how badly his grandma spoke Hindi. Uh, during the emergency, I can remember her with her party colored hair, ranting in this simplified Hindi, which was largely done in the present continuous. Hum karenge, hame karna hai, you know, this completely unknown. So what the Congress really needs, or what an opposition to the BJP really needs is a Hindi-speaking leader who is capable of winning elections for himself and other people. At this point, this seems a distant prospect, but stranger things have happened. We were discussing, uh, Sabanan and, uh, uh, and Arvind and I were discussing uh, uh, the Yamaha party and uh, uh, Sadhana and Arvind both, both, both agreed that this was a kind of TV phenomenon or a TV studio phenomenon. I think it's, uh, there is a broad sense in which uh, the excitement is generated was vastly disproportionate to uh, any possible results that it could have gotten. But just, uh, just to hold out a kind of a long hope, it's useful to remember that the young BJP in 1984 started out with two seats, and the Amadi Party has had four in this election. What is, in a sense, the biggest feature of this election? I think this is something that, um, you know, that hasn't had you know, got the play it needs, the kind of attention it needs. Um, in a sense, as, uh, as Professor Pangaria uh, showed, there's a sense in which possibly the big story in this election is the way in which Narendra Modi connects with, uh, uh, with, with a vernacular, uh, respectable, poor, middle class, uh, semi-urban uh, or urban Indian community, the young community, in a way that's unparalleled. That's clearly non But I think as important is something that seems to be perfectly evident, which is that this election has in fact seen the consolidation of what we describe as the Hindu movement. Through a quarter of a century and eight elections, the BJP's political campus has steadily tracked its ideological norm. The consolidation of the Hindu vote via sectarian campaigns and the violence attending upon them. Now the returns on the strategy have, uh, have been mixed. It worked well in the violent and supercharged aftermath of the Babi Masjid demolition, but as that malignant event receded into the past, its political returns began to diminish too. We know that the legacies of Mandal, SP, and BSP proved stubborn obstacles in the path of Hindu consolidation, with the former hovering up the overseas and the latter, in a sense, not rising the balance. But as these political enemies squabbled with each other in their Kapugumi of UP, the BJP returned to the province with the Gujarat model and its impediment, the Red Bull. I think the BJP is completely correct, and it would be both ungenerous and stupid to deny this fact. It's correct, but it argues that it's fought this election on the twin mantras of growth and governance. It has. Its ability to appeal to a vernacular and really aspirational uh, urban and semi urban population, its ability to channel a plausible story of economic hope based upon only the achievements of Gujarat, its ability to speak to OBC and SC constituencies. Uh, transcending the entry barriers of caste politics is a truly extraordinary achievement. But even as we acknowledge and credit Narendra Modi's game-changing campaign and his many breakthroughs in this election, we shouldn't forget that the Gujarat model has, besides those governments, a third unadvertised element, the disciplining and corralling of insubordinate minorities. This isn't, of course, the way it's put. All majoritarian parties phrase their determination to put minorities in their place by using the passive-aggressive idiom of complaint. Thus, Muslims are being banded to the legal peace, and this must stop. Given 2002, given segregation and subordination of Muslims in Gujarat, the BJP clearly, from this point of view, is the right party to stop. The flip side to the <laughs> consolidation is the political marginalization of minorities. And I use the word minorities deliberately here because the well-publicized failure of the BJP to win Muslim votes has been explained away as a form of false consciousness. It's all sort of hefty down, peculiar to Muslims. 
The beauty of this expedition is that Muslims have yet again been brainwashed by pseudo-secular propaganda into believing the worst. Tawheed Singh, a journalist strongly supportive of Modi, has even astonishingly argued that Muslim opposition to BJP is a kind of power play prompted by the belief that their vote is indispensable to electoral outcomes. Now this media consensus that sees Dalit Modi and, you know, uh, I, I invoke the specter of Subramanian Swami again, as agents of economic rationality and Indian Muslims as brainwashed refusings is an inversion of India's political reality. Given the BJP's unremitting hostility towards them, Muslims are the rational actors here. Not voting for a party that loathes you is a reasonable thing to do. Asking Muslims to admit that they are basically Hindus, on the other hand, isn't. Just so that we are clear that the BJP's message has not exclusively about growth and governance, in the course of this campaign, the party's candidates, the campaign managers, and its leaders have said amongst other things that Muslims prey on the honor of Hindu women as a community, that all terrorists are Muslims, that Muslim entrepreneurs abetted by false Hindus have created a pink revolution where they profit from the slaughter of cows, that Assam's Congress government was part of a conspiracy to kill rhinos, the pride of Assam, to clear their habitats to settle Bangladesh. And we have begun to discuss the BJP's willingness to fish in <coughs> the nuggets, troubled waters after rounds. Two of the principal accused, by the way, were given BJP tickets to contest the elections. I'd like to make a second point here about BJP and minority voters. The CSBS's polling data, which is the only access we have to estimates of community wide voting, because uh, the election commission doesn't break things down by religious community, tells us that Muslims vote alone in their reputation of the BJP. Christians are even more emphatic in their, in their rejection. According to the CSBS, 9% of Muslim voters vote for BHP for the BJP, and the equivalent percentage amongst Christians was even lower at 8%. You might raise the question, why do Christians not respond to the universal economic rationality of the BJP's campaign? And here I suggest that it might have had something to do with the BJP's majoritarianism. Is it safe that it's only five years that the BJP in Orissa explained away and justified attacks on Christians in Kandavan district? Or that Dr. Swami threatened to disenfranchise all non Hindus who didn't refer to their Hindu origins, not just Muslims. I use these specific examples not because I'm confident of uh, what the reception of these things were, who read or heard about this. I'm just saying that it seems to me counterintuitive to believe that the, that the BJP led by Narendra Modi in his emphasis on governance has remade itself into a party of almost transparent economic action. I mean, there is no necessary contradiction between a commitment to economic growth and sectarian politics. These contradictions might emerge if the disruptions of sectarian politics actually impede the path of economic growth. But that's a discussion for another time. I just want to suggest that we really, really shouldn't be assuming that because the majority of the BJP's messaging has been focused upon growth and governance, that because they have fished out, if you will, what might be described as, uh, as uh, their cultural nationalism uh, in specific contexts or specific opportunities in response to specific events, like for example, the Muzaffar Nagar Dives, we shouldn't assume that this has gone anywhere. I mean, I think it's useful for us to note the well-known fact that not one of the BJP's successful groups of our candidates is in Muslim. And it's fair to say that no one was surprised by this. If spokespersons will argue and have argued that the party has no time for tokenism, that Muslims will draw closer to the BJP, this is actually Amit Shah who said this, once they experience the Modi-inspired development that lifts everyone's votes. And this is not an unreasonable uh, claim. We must hope they are right, but even if they are, Republican democracy isn't just about governance, it's also about fraternity, it's about political participation. An election which sees the BJP hugely expand its footprint in India geographically, without changing the fact that in its personnel and its voters, it remains a near exclusively Hindu party, should be a cause for real concern, not least for the party. I just, I'd just like to end with uh, uh, the disreputable business of, uh, of speculation about uh, what might the Modi, Modi do with his mandate. I think it's reasonable for the BJP and its supporters to ask that its critics wait upon events instead of assuming the worst. I mean, there is 
there is a sense in which uh, any invocation of the PGP's past to 2002 of uh, of uh, of Modi's image of Amit Shah's uh, sayings and doings seems almost churlish in the immediate aftermath of an election victory as magnificent as the BJP is won. And I, you know, and I, and I take both uh, the atmospheric point as well as the larger, more substantial point that you know, we need to wait for the government to actually begin to do things before you actually critique it. As they point out, Narendra Modi has many BJP. Uh, I think the last time I heard who said this is a BJP uh, spokesperson called China NC who said um, in response to this uh, this charge of, uh, of a lack of presence of Muslims within the party and a lack of uh, Muslim voting for the party, uh, China NC said uh, that hasn't uh, Narendra Modi said development for all, which he sort of rather spoils it all by saying an appeasement of none. I think the word appeased is a curious word. Is generally used to describe the appreciation of all powerful beings, mortal or divine. In this instance, it's been used to describe India's most depressed and marginal community. You must wonder, you know, why uh, you have this vocabulary used constantly, appeased, pandering in the context of community like this. I think it's reasonable to assume that the BJP is going to literally reconstitute the republic in the near future. To assume that you will is, at least in the near term, pointless alarmism. So I can't see the BJP maneuvering to amend the constitution's preamble to drop the word secular, for example. A word incidentally inserted into it by Mrs. Gandhi in her most authoritarian phase, the emergency. Nor can I see the Red Modi amending Article 25 of the Indian constitution which guarantees freedom of religion. The one thing he isn't, I think, going to do is give critics a clear-cut reason for saying, I told you so. On the other hand, the BJP does have a core vote, which is as if not more committed to what, what is broadly described as cultural nationalism, which could be otherwise described as majoritarian consolidation. And this base vote will certainly wish to be appeased. And there's a range of issues that this government, in this government, could actually sponsor without attempting formal amendments to anything, the law or the constitution. There's a whole range of issues that, in a sense, are ambiguous enough for them to fall within, uh, if you will, the propriety of Republican politics. I mean, one is, of course, cultural. Uh, given Modi's reference to the Greek revolution, it's not unreasonable to speculate that the, that the movement will move, that the government will move to curb any trade that exists in these um, This has the double virtue of being consonant with the direct principles of the constitution and attentive to Hindu sensibilities on this subject. That the principal beneficiaries of the trade are deemed to be Muslim butchers, and that their activities would be curbed would be seen as a benefit in itself. There have been attempts, by the way, to pass a central law on the matter of cultural order that haven't gone anywhere so far. So it's at least possible, if not plausible, that a Modi government could try to move decisive means. I'm, I'm suggesting that what does a BJP government that comes on the back of such enormous expectations, both uh, economic and if you will, uh, uh, political, what does it do uh, to, in a sense, throw red meat to its, uh, to, its, to its core vote without actually disrupting either its, uh, its, uh, its the economic rationality of its project or bringing down upon itself unnecessary opprobrium. There is, for example, the Freedom of Religion Act. Several Indian states have versions of the Freedom of Religion Act, which actually means the opposite of what it suggests. Uh, these acts are intended to curb auto stop conversion. So a person can convert, and the priest officiating a conversion will have to get permission from an officer of the state. Now, I, I should actually add here that most of these acts were passed by Congress state governments. So, uh, you know, uh, this is not something uh, that is owned by the BJP in any way. Oh, two minutes. So, uh, there are a whole bunch of the, the Freedom of Religion Act. Uh, again, uh, there have been attempts to actually pass a central act as opposed to a series of provincial acts which are sort of different and non uniform I think one of the most important issues and uh, speculation about the most important issues is the question of the Ramana. You know, there is a sense which the BGP has consistently said that even though the matter is before the Supreme Court as a kind of uh, on appeal, that this matter should be sorted out in a sense 
uh, via discussion, via agreement, and so on. So I would, you know, I would imagine that given uh, in, in earlier avatars, the BJP has argued that the compulsions of coalition government have uh, not allowed it to pursue its core agenda. But since it is no longer burdened with this, it'd be interesting to see what they do with this. Um, we are surrounded, and there are several other things we do from civil code, um, building board fences, big barbarization, and so on. There are several, I think you get the point. I mean, there are a whole range of wedge issues that we can be could actually use to mobilize its core vote without necessarily doing constitutional amendments. Just to conclude, I'd like to say that we are surrounded in South Asia by nations that struggle with the disruptive and violent consequences of a term towards majoritarians, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. India's principal claim to our attention as a nation state is that amid the semi failed state, it is, and it has been in comparison, an oasis of pluralist calm. We are, in fact, a very violent country, but nowhere near as systemically violent as our neighbors. Should the BJP's manipulation of wedge issues make minorities feel beleaguered and discriminated against? Should government policy and legislation begin to imply that India is de facto, if not de jure, a Hindu state? This might energize the BJP's base, but it almost certainly cause a profound sense of alienation amongst large swathes of the citizenry. Those who object to the example, say, of Sri Lanka as a cautionary tale need to consider and need constantly talk about. At what point would the implementation of the BJP's core issues become a threat to the cohesion of the nation state? Whether we are partisans of BJP or its critics, this is the conversation we need to have both today and through the duration of the Modi Sangha. Thank you. Yeah. 